They're just grateful, thankful, blessed. We start to use them a little bit more. People are, are almost ready to hear when we say those things. Um, so so as, we, as we come into worship, I realize that we, we should, we can use those words every single week. Thankful. Thankful for what the Lord has done. Grateful for his blessings and his grace in our lives. Blessed because he's with us. So as we come into a place and a time of worship this morning, bear that in mind that, that worship, that being grateful and thankful is not just for this time and this season. It's, it's for this place, in this sanctuary, where we can come to him and be grateful for the God who loves us so much. Hope you guys are ready to worship this morning. We're going to have some announcements, and then we'll get started. Welcome to church. Hi folks, hi Pastor Rochelle. There are some great kids events coming up in December. The 10th of December is the Oh Boy Family Christmas event. It is gonna be from 10 to 12. There's gonna be some really cool family activities. If you've got any questions about that, see this girl right here. Also, we're bringing something back that we did last year, Donuts with Santa on the 17th December from 10.30 to noon. If you got any questions about that event, you can see this girl right here. What's that, Pastor Rochelle? You want me to put spiders in your desk? Okay, I got you covered. And Merry Christmas. Hello, Grace. Once every four years, the Church of the Nazarene puts on a great big event for high school students, a big conference. Thousands of kids are converging next summer, 2023, in Tampa Bay, Florida. We've got a big group of our folks, our students, that are planning on making this trip. One of the first ways you can be involved is by eating spaghetti. So on Sunday, December 11th, after church, we're gonna have a spaghetti dinner. You can come and eat it here after church. You get to-go boxes and take it with you. But tickets are going to be on sale. You can buy tickets on the app. You can buy tickets on the table out in the foyer. You can see one of our students that are going to be going. They might approach you and say, would you like to buy tickets to the Spaghetti Dinner Fundraiser? Tickets are going to be $10 a piece. Uh, you can eat here. You can get those things to go. We have a lot of funds to raise for them to be making this trip. They're going to be working hard. They're going to be saving on their own. They're going to be asking grandma and grandpa for money for NYC for Christmas. But one of the ways you can help is by eating spaghetti. So plan on that after church, Sunday, December 11th. Thanks in advance. folks, as Hector and Derek said last week, the ladies are retreating again January 27th through 29th. They are headed to Gatlinburg. This retreat is for all ladies. We'd love to see all ladies, young, old, and in between, sign up and go to the retreat and have a good time. There'll be a great speaker there. There'll be some worship. There'll be some shopping, a lot of time playing games and fellowship. It will be a great time. If you have any questions, see Cindy Cody, not Paige Hartsock. We love you, Paige. We do. Let's pray this morning. God, thank you for an opportunity to come uh, and worship you, an opportunity to be, to be grateful, to be thankful, God, to be reminded of your goodness and to remind you, Jesus, that your people love you. And we're going to do that by singing and worshiping this morning, God, because you are good and, we're, and we remember, we know it. So we praise you, Jesus. Amen.
Praise the Lord. We guys stand with us this morning. God, you are our victory. God, you are our Savior. Lord, Lord, if there's anything going on, Lord, we know we can trust you this morning. Praise your holy name this morning, Jesus.
shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. And almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. And almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadows, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power of God. Aren't you glad you have a God who fights the battles for you? The word helpless comes to mind without him. Helpless. Jesus, thank you. Thank you for being our helper when we're helpless. Lord, we praise you. Thank you, Jesus.
you pray with me? Bow your heads with me. Jesus, I don't know why you pay any attention to him. Except that you love us. I don't know why you make a way for us to talk to the creator of the universe, God. But you do. I don't know why that you choose to forgive instead of condemn, but you have. It's done. And you invite us to walk with you and to know that love and to know that peace and to know that hope. So God, we come into your presence today because you let us. We don't come in as outsiders, fearful. We come in as your sons and daughters. We don't have to come to a special place. We don't have to go through a special person. No pope or priest or preacher separates us from you. We just have to breathe out your name and say, God, here I am again, and I need you. God, thank you that you know us and that you love us today. God, you know our needs. We, uh, we prayed last Sunday for three people that were in the hospital that are now home. God, we praise you that you were with little baby Lydia and she's at home and you were with Clay and he's at home and you were with Faye this week as she received her pacemaker and she is home. God, we thank you for those answers to prayer. And we keep praying for Sean. We keep praying for Ginger Barnett. God, we keep praying uh, for Jim Hammonds. And for Gloria, as she's going through her treatments. God, we pray that you would be with little baby Kyson, uh, Pastor Charlotte's great-grandchild, that you would continue to touch that little baby's body. God, we pray for Jeff Magnuson's mother, Janice, that you would touch her and help her and be with Jeff and his family. God, we have unspoken needs. Two, in particular, weighty, heavy families right now that need you desperately. We pray, God, that you would touch and help. We know that you hear us when we pray. God, remind us that you're near. Remind us that you hear us. Remind us that you're for us and that you're at work. God, there are many here today who have special needs, personal things in our families, in our households, in our marriages, with our kids, where we work, where we go to school, in our finances, in our neighborhoods, we're in our world today. God, we have great need. Thankfully, we serve a great God who has a great track record of being a God who loves his creation. So, Lord, help us to trust you again today. Give us enough trust for this day. And tomorrow morning, when the sun comes up, we'll trust you for that day, too. But in the meantime, God, be with us today. May we know your presence. In your great name, we pray these things. And all God's people said, amen. Don't you, isn't that, that's fun to do. Okay, turn around. Look at somebody. Tell them your name, whether they asked your name or not. Tell them your name. Be seated. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. I'm glad you're here. Right after church today, we've been collecting food for two months, and today's delivery day. So if you would like to help take some of these food boxes, we have frozen turkeys and food boxes and all that, please see this nice lady who is waving at you now. 
That is Pastor Charlotte. And uh, Charlotte loves people. If you need to learn how to love people, spend time with Pastor Charlotte. And you can have an opportunity. Yes, you have an opportunity to today go and love on some folks. Uh, and we are going to go and love bomb them with food for Thanksgiving. So right after church today, what do you need? Tell me what you need. Okay. See her. We need transportation. So if you have a vehicle that can squeeze in a few of these boxes and you can go right after church over to Lincoln Homes, we need to get it over there because it's here and it needs to be there. So we need your help. Um, two weeks from today is the Sunday of Live Nativity. If you're familiar with what we do every Christmas, um, there's a Friday, Saturday, and Sunday early in December where we share the story of Christmas with Clarksville. And so we need your help. If you've helped with that before, you know the drill. If you've never helped with that before, we use lots of volunteers. There are sign-up sheets out in the foyer. You can go out there and volunteer for one night, two nights, three nights, and you can have a role in what we're doing and sharing the Christmas story. Next summer in 23 is, uh, is NYC summer. NYC is our Nat Church of the Nazarene once every four years. Uh, big, big, big event for high school kids. Uh, usually we've got a bunch of high school kids sitting over here. They are down at Treveca today, and they're participating in Momentum. Uh, but uh, a bunch of those students are going to Tampa next summer, and it's a, it's a big trip. It's an expensive trick trip, and you can help. If you dig into your pockets this morning, you have like $60,000. But if you don't, you may have $10 for spaghetti. So we've got tickets that are on sale out in the foyer. We're going to eat together, or you can get it to go on Sunday the 11th uh, in three weeks from today. And you can eat spaghetti and help kids go to NYC next summer. Um, this Thursday is Thanksgiving. No old codgers lunch. When they do come back December 1st, they're going to be at Peabody. So we've been eating at uh, Mission Barbecue. Um, all guys invited on Thursdays at noon. We're not meeting this week because of football. Sorry, Thanksgiving. Um, and then next Thursday, uh, we'll be back and at Peabody's. We won't have Wednesday night uh, services this week. So keep that in mind. Uh, we're going to receive an offering this morning. We have two anniversary checks. We send kids to camp with these happy wedding anniversary offerings. So my son and daughter-in-law, Jackson and Leah, have been married two years. And somebody else's son and daughter-in-law, Bill and Debbie Blackwell, have been married 50 years. Well done, kids. We're going to receive an offering. If I can have some ushers to come and help me receive the offering this morning. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the church, the church family. The church isn't a building. The church isn't a location or an address. The church is your people called together for a purpose. Thank you, God, that you've given us the church. Help us to be grateful. So whether folks are here this morning on Trenton Road or worshiping us with us online, watching from home, God, we pray that your spirit would be with us. We pray believing that your spirit is with us. Would you be blessed through this act of worship? In your great name we pray. Amen. So can I tell you a story this morning? 
Yes, Rich, you can tell us a story. Thank you very much. You guys are too, too kind. So once upon a time, let me tell you a story this morning. Once upon a time, there was a man named Matthias. He was a good man. He had a wife, Lydia, four children, a small tent in the marketplace where he sold the vegetables that he grew in his garden, and he sold eggs from his chickens. He lived in the border town of Nain between Galilee and Samaria. His life was modest, but good, so good. He didn't need a lot. He had a loving wife, healthy children, good friends. He worshiped God on the Sabbath. He was content and very happy. One morning, he went out early to the garden, and the tip of his right forefinger was bleeding. That's strange. He thought he, he didn't remember cutting himself. But he wrapped it up, and it healed. Sometime later, he noticed the fingers on his other hand were numb. It stayed with him throughout the day. The numbness went away and then returned and then went away and then returned. He began to fear. Over the next few weeks, one hand was the other hand. Both hands became numb, then completely numb, then his feet, his ears. He couldn't feel his ears, the tip of his nose. Dread started to overwhelm him. He had kept it to himself, denying the worst. But his wife, women are observant. His wife was aware. She noticed his fumbling when he tried to pick up small items. She noticed how long it took to lace up his boots or bring in the vegetables from the garden. She noticed the change in his walk and his mood, the lack of laughter, and she noticed the fear in his eyes. Occasionally, when he was struggling, their eyes would lock. And they would communicate without words, but she didn't say anything. One night, as the family was sitting down to the evening meal, Matthias passed a bowl to his little girl, and the daughter didn't take it. He looked at her, strange, she was looking at the bowl, and there was blood all along the side of the bowl. He had cut himself again, blood on the side of the bowl, blood on his robe. He hadn't even noticed it. Again, he looked at his wife, Lydia. Her eyes were downcast. Matthias took a long breath. He knew what he had to do. Reading his mind, Lydia said, Do you want me to go with you to the synagogue? And he shook his head, No, I'll go alone. She packed a few things for him, bundled some clothes in a blanket, put some food in a sack. And she stood at the door. The children were confused. None of them understood what was happening. They were asking all sorts of questions. Matthias walked out of his small house, turned and looked at his family. He didn't touch his wife or his children. The man and woman just looked at each other with fear in their eyes. Matthias walked away knowing he would never see his family again. He went to the synagogue and asked to see the priest. The meeting with the priest took 10 minutes. Matthias didn't hold it against the Priest, he was just doing his job, but in less than an hour, his life had been turned upside down. He'd gone from the table with his family to the priest to the town gate, now outside the walls. 
He had leprosy. And he could never come inside the town gates ever, ever again. Everyone knew where the lepers lived. There was a cave in the hills outside of the town and that housed a small leper colony. They eked out a poor existence there from begging from travelers or just outright thievery. No one ever went there. The lepers were helpless. Worse than that, they were hopeless. Have you ever felt like that? For Matthias, that first day seemed endless. That day stretched into a week, a month, six months, a year, then two. Infected men and women would deteriorate, rot away, and die. New lepers would come periodically to take their place. Matthias would daydream about home, about his wife and children. Would she remarry? What did his children look like now? Were his sons doing well in the school, in the synagogue? Were his parents still living? Every now and there, they would, then they would hear tales of miracles. But miracles didn't happen. Every once in a while, they would hear tales about a man who could heal people. And myths tend to circulate around those who have nothing else to talk about and among those who have no hope. People cling to any shred of hope, but Matthias was a realist. He wasn't some dreamer. He had no hope until Jesus walked by. I've asked Lou to come and share this morning. And I'd ask you to listen, not just to Lou's story, but listen for the Holy Spirit this morning. Good morning. I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. I'm a recovered hopeless individual myself. Pastor Rich was talking about hopelessness. Sometimes it's very visible as in the leper. Many of our hurts, habits, and hang-ups aren't always as visible. I was one of these type of hopeless people. I believe a lot of this comes from how I was raised and how my relationship with God has changed over the years. I was raised Roman Catholic who accomplished all the major gates of spirituality as a child and youth. They include baptism, confession, first communion, and confirmation. Even after achieving these spiritual gates, I didn't understand about a relationship. Eventually to the point that I detested God, his house, and his presence. I was raised through a few broken marriages and a few different alcoholic parents. I would say that I have two fathers, and one mother. I was the oldest child and a male. There was a point that I resented my birth father so much that I enjoyed calling my stepdad father. This was done out of spite. I was a teenager whose first drink was given to me by my mother. She claimed this would ensure that I, wouldn't be, that I would be able to handle the alcohol and wouldn't display the characteristics that were displayed by my earthly fathers. This pro further proved to me that it was okay for me to, be, to drink alcohol as a minor. During high school, I wasn't Mr. Popular, but I wasn't a loner. I was a type that was half geek and half jock. I could fit in with all the cliques and not necessarily hang with one. I was also expo exposed to pornography and drugs throughout my teenage years. I was taught many things growing up, like you can only you can only be what you achieve. A common saying in my house was you can achieve anything if you put your mind to it. I do have one particular instance that reminds me of being completely hopeless as a child. My brother and I shared a bedroom and our beds were in a loft kind of up above everything. And my stepdad built a ladder on the wall so we could climb up and down from 
a lot. There was a point during my adolescence, cut tight a sheet around my neck and the top rung of that ladder and jumped. I was hopeless and saw no possible redemption. So I attempted to take matters into my own hands. As I continued through adolescence, I never had an earthly father figure to show me the example of what it looks like to properly, properly treat women or young ladies. So my interpretation was skewed. This further led to male chauvinism. Along with these great character traits that I was learning and being taught, I was also taught how to not properly deal with my anger. This was usually done through a variety of cuss words directed at your spouse. It wasn't always appropriate for us kids to imitate our parents. Another common saying in our household was, do as I say, not as I do. I was so hopeless, I even had a run-in with the law due to retail theft and lied about the entire thing to my mother. I did eventually tell her, but I'm sure it was over some drinks. I was striving con for control and took everything into my own hands. I joined the military at age 19 with the primary focus of getting out of my house and to try to figure out who I was to find myself. Through the spirit of self-accomplishment and to be the best that I could be that was instilled with me by my family, I enlisted for an Airborne Ranger contract and went to basic training and these patterns further continued and were exemplified. I was striving for an identity and continued to engage in hopeless actions. I almost got kicked out of basic training for failure to soldier. My oldest son was conceived out of wedlock. Even though I didn't see the error of my ways, I wouldn't let him be born out of wedlock. I didn't want him to be raised in a broken house like I was. I wanted better for him than what I had had. Although as a result, I married my wife and we would be the family that never lived together. I was the military father away in Georgia and they were my Illinois family. Maybe not broken, but not together either. In Georgia and in the Ranger Regiment, I experienced more of the exact same nature, even to a heightened level. I was indestructible, I was invincible. I was further surrounded in an environment that was entirely created on upon what I had achieved and what I had accomplished. I received my first major incident in the, with alcohol in the form of a DUI. I was only 20 years old and I had a fake ID that I had made. This further inflated my ego about how I could achieve anything if I set my mind to it. I just had a bit of bad luck here and there and got caught this one time. I was hopeless. As my military career continued, I re-enlisted instead of going home to be the father, the head of the house that I was called to be because I didn't understand what that concept was. And it was all about my self-achievement, my accomplishments. Throughout all of this, I continued to self-reward myself for my accomplishments that I was achieving through sex, drugs, alcohol, and anything else that I could give myself. I was supposed to ETS or get out of the military in March of 99. And in early December, I decided to re-enlist. My deceitful actions led to my divorce because I wasn't honest. I told my mother about my actions before my spouse. I even went so far as continually trying to make my spouse believe that I was getting out at my ETS date. I didn't want to tell her before Christmas and ruin that, the holiday. I did finally tell her the truth in January and I ruined much more than a holiday. I was hopeless and trying to manipulate everything that I could. These patterns of life continued, and I couldn't see the hopelessness that was in my life. All these attempts, all these ways of trying to fill the void to find out what was missing. I was a womanizer, porn addict, an alcoholic, a short-fused and self-pleasuring person who on the outside was the same as everybody else. At least that's what I thought. There was a point in time that I even joked around with my friends about how we don't go into God's house and he doesn't come in ours. Except that we were serious. It wasn't a joke. I was very far from rejecting God. 
I'm going to fast forward a few years. During these years, I continued to do much of the same. Many close calls that I can't even count them. I met my wife, Shelly, on a blind date. I can't say we started on godly principle, but she did get me back into this church and reopened my eyes to what I was missing. We did go through marital counseling with a military chaplain, and I even cussed within the first 10 minutes of walking in this house. As I was coming back to God, I would say I was a spiritual ticket puncher, going through the motions, sometimes trying to do the right thing, sometimes. But many things in my life hadn't changed. My spirituality was launched into high gear when I was injured in 2006 in Iraq. I almost lost my left eye. I even called my wife and said I just had a little scratch and would eventually thank God for allowing me to see that he saved my life. When I returned home, there was a church revival right here in 2007. I came up to the altar right over here and asked God into my heart to reveal the things that I needed to work on because I couldn't see them. I was hopeless. But this was the beginning to understanding that turning to God is my hope. It's my only hope. This was the beginning of an honest relationship with Jesus Christ. I began to get more involved with church and Bible studies. I attended a church membership class, and I remember one of the first men's Bible studies that I was involved in. I heard the term white knuckler. What's a white knuckler, you're thinking? I was gripping the steering wheel of life so hard and wouldn't let go of it because I was afraid to let God control it, that I was bearing nothing but white knuckles. I was beginning to feel part of the church and no longer a spiritual ticket puncher, but I still failed to see my issues. I became a 242 group and host in September, October of 2008. Through the entire process, God was continuing to transform my character defects, my anger, my language, my chauvinism. There was a point that my anger got the best of me in front of my 242 group, and I yelled at the children and Shelly and threw a chair up the stairs at the children and didn't realize until looking back how blind I was to it all. I was exactly the same as my earthly father, so demanding that no one would question or confront me. But I was still white knuckling things, doing them my way. On November 7, 2009, I experienced my breaking point, or my revelation point, the place where I truly realized how out of control my life and how hopeless I had become. I was a team sergeant that let one of his subordinate soldiers drive drunk while I was sitting in the passenger seat. This was a complete failure of leadership, responsibility, and judgment. This led me to acknowledge my issues with alcohol, but I refused to admit alcoholism. Throughout all of this, the soldier and I talked, and we firmly believed that God was behind all of this, behind our enlightenment. We both had been choosing to ignore our alcohol issues. We both were hopeless and didn't see how truly bad our lives were being affected by it. When we returned to Fort Campbell, we both self-enrolled into the post-alcohol subs yeah, alcohol substance abuse program. The answer to the military's answer to any chemical substance abuse. I continued to doubt that I was a full-blown alcoholic and avoided any real involvement in Alcoholics Anonymous AA. After about three to four months of meeting with our with a counselor, I broke down saying that my life was unmanageable. I was completely out of control. I finally admitted how hopeless I had become. I finally listened to God and released the wheel saying my life was unmanageable. I struggled with AA and the ability to, find, to define a God of my own understanding and heard about Celebrate Recovery or CR. Celebrate Recovery is a God-based 12-step program that, that uh, allows you to, real, to realize and recover from all of life's hurts, habits, and hang-ups. CR taught me that I'm not hopeless. And it, with God, all things are possible. Even, even as I am right now, I'm still getting pulled closer and closer to God. 
I still wrestle with priorities. This has led me to see God and to understand knowledge way more. I see him in so many more things now. God has allowed me to grow through all forms of recovery. And I know that Celebrate Recovery was at the center of this, knowing that Jesus Christ is my higher power and placing this into action. Faith without action is dead. During the completion of my first 12 steps, I learned to place all hope in God. I was involved with two 4-2 groups, Bible studies, AA, eventually leading and getting an AA started on post. I not only went through the CR steps, but became involved in CR leadership. I thoroughly enjoyed working and still do work in the media booth. I've even served on this church board a few times. Don't get me wrong, the enemy is still real and still lurking, as in 1 Peter 5.8, lurking like a lion waiting to strike. The enemy is luring us one step closer to the edge, trying to get us to fall and to fail. November 7th of this year, I celebrated 13 years of sobriety. After many years of working the steps, I truly have become thankful for the life that God has given me. Without these trials and tribulations, I wouldn't be the man that God wanted me to be. I wouldn't be here today. Thank you for letting me share. So it's Thanksgiving Sunday, and on Thanksgiving Sundays, preachers around the world get up and preach one story a lot of times, and I've not done that in five Thanksgivings with you, and I'm doing it today. So if you want to take your Bible and turn to Luke chapter 17, I want to read you the rest of the story, and then we'll come and we'll share the Lord's Supper this morning. But let me read about this story of Jesus walking along the way. Luke chapter 17, starting in verse 11. Now on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village, ten men who had leprosy, and I struggle sometimes with how the Bible writes about the stories. Ten men with leprosy met him. That's an incomplete thought. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice. That's a decent representation of they screamed out in desperation. Jesus, Master, have pity on us. Lepers had special disdain in the Jewish world. Not just did you have an infectious disease, but leprosy was a sign of God's displeasure. So you were not just a physically repulsive, you were spiritually repulsive. And you were excluded. Family, friends, synagogue, the, the temple, the tabernacle, you could not come You could not be in community because God had cursed you. When Jesus saw them, he said, go and show yourselves to the priests. The only way to come back and be in community again was to be approved clean by the priest. That never, ever happened. If you had leprosy, you had leprosy. It doesn't just come and go and you're fine and you can come back in and later it, 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 you're, you're, it's done. But it was written in into the Old Testament, into the law, that if you came and showed yourself clean, you could come back home. Jesus says, go and show yourselves to the priests. As they went, they were cleansed. See, it's Thanksgiving. We preach this passage on Thanksgiving because of what happens next. One guy comes back and says thanks. It's a good Thanksgiving message. But it's not, you know, that when we gather this Thursday, we're going to give thanks. We're going to give thanks for turkey. Thanks for day off. Thanks for pumpkin pie. Thanks for football. Gunk, 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 right? 
We're, we're going to give thanks for the things. It's good to have the things. We're glad I've got a house and the house is warm when it's cold outside. I've got a car and the car runs. I've, I've, got, I've got things that I'm thankful for and we give thanks at Thanksgiving. That's not really the message of this story. This man, we called him Matthias a minute ago, this man had no hope. None. He was waiting to die. There was no hope for him until Jesus walked by. He could not fix himself. There was no one who was going to help him or give him hope until Jesus walked by. And he calls out in desperation. And Jesus answers. He didn't just have something to be thankful for this Thanksgiving. He got his life As they went, they were cleansed. One of them, when he saw that he was healed, he came back again, inadequate words, praising God in a loud voice. He fell at the feet of Jesus, overwhelmed with gratitude that God had given him his life. Jesus said, we're not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except for this foreigner, this Samaritan? He said to the man, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. What do you want Jesus to do for you today? What do you want Jesus to do for you today? It could be that you're riding high today. It could be that things are going well. It could be that you, could, you couldn't find a problem in your world if you tried. Good for you. Most likely all of us are on the hopeless scale. There's something in my life, something in your life that you are helpless to overcome. You cannot do this on your own. There is no hope for you except Jesus. And let me tell you good news today. Jesus is walking by. Today. You say, Rich, I can't see him. I don't really believe it. And I'd say, you're just going to have to trust me. The Jesus that I know is close today. And you can call out to him today. Jesus is near. You may think your situation is hopeless. You may think that all that Old Testament, New Testament, Jesus, New Testament church power, that all ran out sometime this morning. You're the unicorn. You've got a problem that Jesus just can't deal with. Not so. Jesus specializes in hopeless cases. Tell him what you want from him. Tell him what you want him to do for you this morning. Then trust him that he hears you. He's for you. He can heal you, he can help you, and that he loves you. We're going to close at the table. I've asked some folks to come and to help serve this morning, and if you'd make your way up front. This is a perfect place for hopeless cases. The table, the altar, the church. You're, you, something's not wrong with you because you've got these issues. We come because we have these issues. I'm going to pray before we receive the Lord's Supper this morning. And if something that I said or Lou said or something that the Holy Spirit said to you resonates with you, you need to be here. You need to come to the table today. You need to come and receive today. 
Would you stand up with me in just a moment? I'll have you come. Let me pray for us before we, before we serve this thing. Lord Jesus, we all have great need. But there are some here this morning that feel the despair of hopelessness. Their world is fear. Their world is out of control. We are helpless. And yet you have come near us. Hear us call out to you this morning. We know that you do. Speak to our spirits. Speak to our hearts. Do again today what you did for those lepers. May we joyfully receive today what we need most, and that is you. Forgiveness of sins and hope. Give us your spirit that walks with us, talks with us. Make us new again today. God, give us our lives back. Life found in you. We trust you. In your powerful name we pray. Amen. If you'd like to come this morning, you can come and receive. There are the small prepackaged cups. You can take that and receive. You can come this morning and take the bread, the body of Christ, dip it into the cup, the blood of Christ, and receive. And as you return to your seat, if you'd like to spend some time here at the altar and talk to your Heavenly Father, you're invited to do that. But you're invited to the table this morning. We're reminded that on the night that our Lord was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had blessed it, he shared it with his disciples, saying, this bread is my body, broken for you. And then after supper, he took the cup, and when he had blessed it, he passed it to his disciples, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you, for the forgiveness of your sins, to give you life. Receive Jesus today. Amen. I've read the words in Find the one missing field like that was written with me on your mind. And the prodigal son who ran, leaving his home behind. The part where the father came running to meet him, to see that with me on your mind. Who am I that the king of the world would give one single thought about my broken heart? Who am I that the God of all grace wipes the tears from my face and says, come as you are? You paid the price. You took the cross. You gave your life and you did it all. Just knowing you call me a child It's flooding my soul with unspeakable hope Thank you, Lord, it was me on your mind Who am I that the king of the world Would give one single thought about my broken heart Who am I that the God of all grace Wipes the tears from my face face and says, come as you are. You paid the price. You took the cross. You gave your life. You did it all with me on your mind. Oh, with me on your mind. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I have.
You're preparing a place where the sorrows are raised, and when I stand before you, I'll find all along it was me on your mind. Who am I that the king of the world would give one single thought about my broken heart? Who am I that the God of all grace wipes the tears from my face and says, Come and you are. You paid the price. You took the cross. You gave your life. And you did it all with me on your mind. Oh, with me on your mind. Oh, me on your mind. Oh, it was me on your mind. Our Heavenly Father shouldn't love me, but He does. Most likely, He shouldn't love you either, but He does. And if you need to hear that there is a God who is coming near you, and you are hopeless today, call out to Him. If you've done that, you need to tell somebody. I'm a somebody. Tell me. Tell somebody what Jesus is doing in you, what you need him to do. Enlist them to help you and pray with you. As you go today, take this hope that you've been given and share it with others who need hope. Let me bless you as you go today. May the God of hope Fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Praise Jesus. Go share hope. God bless you. We'd love to have your help getting food out to 